Welcome to Overland Park Community Church, throwing you guys a curveball, one song, and then we're going to bring the word, but fear not, we're going to worship some more. I uh, just felt led to do this uh, this weekend, and, and certainly uh, enjoyed that song, Your Love Defends Me, uh, something maybe the Chiefs should have been singing yesterday, but <laughs> anyway, it was heartbreaking, uh, but we're, we're used to it, right, as Kansas City fans, and, and so last week um, we learned... Uh, that sin works against us, God works for us and in us and through us, and we're works of art. So we were like just unpacking that last part uh, of of that chapter and and beginning to like dive into that. And so this week, or the first part of chapter two, so this week um, the Word wants to remind us of some things. It's kind of keying in on this, and, and, and I saw Paul, like he says a couple times, remember, like remember. One of the reasons that I'm always encouraging you to have a daily abide time with the Lord is it helps us to remember things, helps us to kind of recall things that enable us to be sensitive to where the Lord is leading us on a daily basis. And so as we look at this, Paul is he's saying, listen, listen church, dear church, I want, you to, I want you to remember some things. And the first thing that he says to us is, dear church, you were far from God. Like the the first thing Paul says here in verse 11, he says, Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship um, in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope, and without God in this world. And so Paul, like he's like, man, like you need to remember that. Remember that you were included or excluded from citizenship within the kingdom of God. We, we were aliens, foreigners to God. We, we, there, there was this thing like, so God chooses this. He, he makes a promise to a guy. And the guy's name is Abraham in the Old Testament. He says, I'm going to make you into a father of many nations. And so in that promise, the people of Israel come out of that promise. And I, I kind of led you through this um, uh, in a, a couple of weeks ago how, you know, the Gentile or the, the Jews sort of came out of this promise to Abraham. And then there was the, the 12 tribes of Jacob uh, who was renamed to Israel. And then they moved into Egypt and they grew into a in excess of a million people, and God raises up Moses and delivers them out of the bondage of slavery, and they become a people without land, but they're promised a land. And then eventually they, they, they receive their land, and, and God tells them to make a, a temple, and they make a temple. And in that temple, there was um, what is known as uh, the court of the Gentiles. And so there was a wall around um, the inside of where the temple was located, and anybody who was not a Jew, who was a chosen person of God, they, they were not allowed to go beyond that wall. And so Paul is saying to the, the Gentile Christians, remember like that you were excluded from all of this, that, there was, there, there was, uh, that you were treated as a, a foreigner, there were, no, there were no covenants available to you. You were without hope and without God in this world. And, and there actually, archaeologists have discovered an inscription from Herod's temple that they dug up, and it says, No foreigner, no foreigner may enter within the barricade which surrounds the sanctuary and enclosure. Anyone who is caught doing so will have himself to blame for his ensuing death. Like, it was serious. And so... Everyone was far from God. Now, here's even the Jews who thought they were near to God because they had the promise they were far from God because they used the wall, this even this wall of, of, of separation from the Gentiles in which God was just trying to communicate to people how holy he was, how righteous he was. But the, the Jews had turned that wall and they, they had developed racism, okay? And so they were... They were like they they looked especially um, against the Samaritans. They hated the Samaritans, who are people who are half Jewish, and 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 so they 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 just disdained them. And so there was all of this like 
racism going on and, 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 and people were made to feel excluded even. And so the Jews thought they were close to God because they had the promise of God and God had never intended for them to make people feel that way. He was just communicating that he was holy and he would be treated as holy and he had this incredible message that he was going to bring people, he was going to fix this brokenness in the, in the world. And so even though the Jews thought they were near to God, they were far from God. And so Paul says, listen, like what, what, what you need to do is you need to remember that you were far from God. And I think that's a healthy thing for us to do, man. When I worship, one of the things I do is I just stop and I think about what my life was like when I was far from God. Um, sometimes, man, I'll get caught up in a worship song, and, and it'll be talking about sin, and I'll think about some sin that I was so heavily and deeply involved in, and think about the time that I was far from God, and, and I was without hope. I was excluded, and, and I become broken, man, and, and I, I weep before the Lord. I'm just overwhelmed at the fact that I was so far from God. I was excluded. But Paul also, and that's the good news, is that he wants to, us to remember, dear church, you are now near to God. So he goes from you were far from God to now you are near to God. Look at verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once who once were far away, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace. And in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. He came and he preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. And so this whole thing, man, everything you see in the Old Testament is always a picture, a copy of what's going on in heaven. Like there's always a copy, even the, the high priest, like Jesus, the high priest that walked on the planet was a copy of the shadow of, uh, uh, of the high priest Jesus in heaven. And so there's a dividing wall of hostility between humanity and God. And Jesus comes and he dies on the cross of Calvary to destroy that barrier. What's interesting is when Paul writes this, the temple is still standing, and he's talking about how Christ came to destroy the barrier. Now, you know, if you study the Gospels, when Jesus uttered, it is finished, and he gave up the Spirit and breathed his last on the cross, there was an earthquake, and the veil of the temple was rent in two, which was this huge curtain that separated where the Ark of the Covenant was located in the most holy place from the holy place. And so behind there was the Ark of the Covenant, and the Ark of the Covenant, all the way back into the time that, that of Moses, when God uh, told Moses to build the Ark of the Covenant, is it represented God's presence on the planet. And so when Jesus died on the cross of Calvary, that veil was rent in two. It was destroyed. And at the time of the writing of the book of Ephesians, the temple was still standing. But in just a few years, the, the temple was destroyed. And even that barrier wall of the Gentiles was destroyed. And God was making a way. He is now approachable. We now have access. And so he's even saying to the Jew who was near to the covenant, you were still far from God, and so Jesus came and he preached to those who were near the Jewish people and those who were far, the Gentile people, which is anyone who is not Jewish. And he's saying, listen, Jesus made a way for us to be near to God, and through the blood of Christ, he has brought us near and destroyed the barrier of hostility. <laughs> like, when you worship, you got to know, man, that God is hostile toward people who don't know him. That's not Jimmy Holbrook saying that. Like, that's the word saying that God, there's a barrier of hostility. It has been removed, and the only way it is removed is through the blood of Christ. And so when we worship, man, we come in and we worship, and we, we're thinking about how far we were from God and that we've been brought near. Why? Because we came to church today? No. The only way you one can be brought near is through the blood of Christ. Never based upon our performance and what we do and, and, and know how much we achieve 
uh, and, and how, how much we serve in the kingdom. It's never that way. It's always on the blood of Christ. And so we, we can get caught up in worship as we're singing these songs and we realize, man, I was, I was far from God, but because of the blood of Christ that was shed on Calvary, that destroyed the barrier of hostility, has covered my sin, and I'm brought near. And man, I'm just, I'm expressing my heart in worship to the God of the universe that I was far, and now I'm near. Because of the goodness and the grace of Christ that has been applied to my life and covered my sin. And what was the purpose? It is to create a new man. Like you're not the same man that you, you used to be. It is to create a new man out of the Jew and out of the Gentile and bring them together one in Christ, covered by the blood. The Bible teaches us in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Dear church, you were far from God. Dear church, you've been brought near to God. You are a new man. You are a new woman if you know Jesus. You, you, you are a new person in Christ. And, and, and he says, remember that when you, when you come together, when you're walking through life, as, as you're doing your job and you get discouraged and down and, and the enemy's trying to beat you up, you just stop there and go, wait a minute. I'm not far from God anymore. I am near to God. The barrier of hostility has been destroyed. It doesn't matter what you throw at me. I am near to God. I'm a child of his. My sin has been covered by the blood of Christ. And man, he's like, if you remember that, it will, it will put you into this place of, of true joy. And it gives us access to the Father. Like access to God. There are many religions who teach that you have to do certain things. You have to jump through hoops in order to get to God. You have to do certain things. The Bible clearly teaches us if you want to get to God, you, all you need is Jesus. And you got access to God. Like we can talk to God anytime we want. We can express our hearts to God. We can express our fears to God. We can let God know that we're anxious and ask him to help us. And he, as a matter of fact, he says, he tells us to do that. Be anxious for nothing but in everything through prayer and thanksgiving. Make your requests made known to God. Like pour your heart out to God and remember, dear church, remember. You were far from God, but you've brought, been brought in here. And that's, that's good news, but, but it gets better. He says, not only were you far from God and, and now you're near to God, he says, dear church, you are rising to the Lord. What? Yeah, yeah, you're right, like, dear church, this is for you today. You are rising to the Lord. Not you will rise to the Lord. You are presently rising to the Lord. Let's read it and see what he says. Consequently, so what's that mean? You were far from God. You've been brought near. If you've been brought near, then the consequences of your nearness to God are you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household. Members of his household. Listen, if you are a member of the household, you have special privileges. If you go over to someone's household, and you ring the doorbell. If you are a member of the household, you open the door and walk in. If you go over to someone's household, you walk in and you wait for them to tell you whether or not to take your shoes off or to leave them on. If you're a member of the household, you fling your shoes wherever you want. Right, kids? And you jump in the chair you want and you kick back and you watch TV and you go to the fridge and get what you want out of the fridge because you are a member of the household. You know what I'm saying? If you're not a member of the household, you're just kind of like, well, I'm going to wait. You hope that you're at a good host house. But if you're not, and even if you are, you're still a little bit uncomfortable. But man, when you're a member, it's good times, right? He says, you are a member of the household of God. Built. What are you built on? On the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, here it is, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. Come on, man. Like the church, like what I love about this is the church is not modern. It is ancient. It's relevant, but it's ancient. It goes back to the foundation of the apostles. What is the foundation of the apostles? The apostles were the guys who, who were chosen to have the miraculous power of God work through their lives, and they gave testimony to what? That Jesus Christ said he was God in the flesh. That Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary. That Jesus Christ taught us to live this way. That Jesus Christ rose from the dead. We saw him. 
We, we ate with him. We talked with him post-crucifixion. He came back from the dead, and we interacted with him. And they write the Gospels and the rest of the New Testament, and the apostles leave us that foundation that is built on the apostles' testimony, and Jesus is the chief cornerstone. What does that mean? Well, in the ancient world, when they would build buildings, they would they would take the best stone they could find and they would place it in the most critical spot and everything else would lean on that stone. And so Jesus is what we lean on through the foundation of the apostles building us the testimony of Jesus. And though we were far, now we are near because our sins have been covered by the blood of Christ and we are part of the household of God that leans into Jesus as the chief cornerstone. And not only do we lean into him, we are rising up. Since Jesus rose from the dead, the church has been rising up stone by stone in unity. Like that's, that's why I'm always like giving this invitation. Dude, have you been born again in the spirit of Christ? Like not, not a religious person, but do you know Jesus? And has he, has he changed you from the inside out? Because when you're born again, you're laid, bam, on the chief's cornerstone, and you rise up. And this has been happening since the time Jesus rose from the dead. And I'm reminded of the Tower of Babel in the book of Genesis. The story of the Tower of Babel is God created humanity, and they had multiplied. And they, they were doing incredible things. And so they got their heads together, and they started building a tower. And they said, let us build a tower into the heavens so that we, we know who we are. And they were totally focused on themselves, humanism. And, and so they were just, this, this tower was coming up and God, the Bible tells us that God came down and he said, let us go down and confuse them. Let's go down and like just mess that all up. Now, why would God do that? Because it sounds on the surface like, man, they're doing something good. They're building a tower. That's what people should work together, together and build something. They were building something that had nothing to do with God, and they were trying to make a new religion that God never did ask for them to make. And so they were not thinking about God. They were thinking about themselves. It sounds familiar, doesn't it? it? sounds like modern day. And so God goes and he messes it all up, and he confounds their languages. And they, all, they, they can't speak the same language anymore. And it freaks them out, man, and they scatter. They're not working together anymore because they had not focused on, on God. They would focused on themselves, and it, it ended up in this confusing state. Well, Jesus says, he says, dudes, after he rose from the dead, he's meeting with the apostles. He said, I want you to go to, this, to, to, to Jerusalem. I want you to wait. And he had been teaching them that the, that the spirit would come, the comforter, the paraclete, he would come and fall on them. They didn't know exactly what that meant. And so they're waiting and they're praying and they, they don't know what to do. They're still afraid. They're afraid if they come out of hiding that the people uh, out in Jerusalem, the, the Jewish leaders are going to execute them like they did Jesus. They're, they're fearful of the Roman leadership as well. And so they're, they're, they're like... They're confused. They don't know what to do. And they're in this room and they're praying. And, and the Bible says in Acts chapter 2 that all of a sudden the ground was shaking, shaking and the Spirit of God descended. We call it the day of Pentecost. And the Spirit falls down upon this room of, of, of disciples that are in there praying. And they come out, man, and, they're, and, and the Bible says they're speaking in tongues. And they come out and, they're, and, they're, and, and people are like, all the people in the streets are watching them. And they, and, and they say that what appears to be uh, flames of tongues resting over them, of fire over their heads. And they're just talking. And guess what? Everybody in every language could understand everything they were saying. And it was the reversal of the Tower of Babel. He said, you want to get to heaven? It's going to be through the foundation of Christ and the Spirit of God living in the human being. And so now there's unity. And God says, this is the way we will build a tower to the heavens. Remember, Jesus said that, that he saw that uh, when he was called Nathaniel, he said, I saw you by the tree and, and, and you were dreaming about um, uh, Jacob's dream of angels um, ascending and descending through the ladder. Like, it, it, just I'm reminded, like the Spirit is, is reminding me in this moment in time how critical it is for believers to understand we are rising up to the Lord today. 
Like even in this sermon, as I'm, as I'm preaching and proclaiming the truth of the gospel of Christ, it is rising up with Jesus as the cornerstone, and I'm leaning into him, and you're here in agreement with me. And the church is rising up to the throne room of God. And it will do it until the last second ticks on the clock of time. And the Father says, it is time to go get your people. And, and, and Jesus will leave the throne room and he will come and all that is invisible, that is seen by faith, will be shifted and will be seen with the physical eyes. And men who are still far from God and women who are still far from God will cry out for the rocks to fall on them in terror because they know that Jesus is in fact real. There will be no mistaking when the king returns to the planet the second time. The first time he came as a suffering servant. The next time he comes as a conquering king. And we are rising up to that moment. The church is rising up to the Lord as stone after stone is laid upon the chief cornerstone of Christ. So dear church, remember you were far from God. Remember you're near to God. Remember that you are rising to the Lord. And the big idea is, dear church, God lives in you. Man, who teaches that? God lives in me. Look at what it says in verse 22. And in him you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. God lives in us. Last week I shared with you that you're, not o- that you're a work of art. But I would submit to you today that you're not only a work of art. You are the dwelling of God. Like he lives in you, and he longs for you to learn the secret of surrender. I, I pray for you guys weekly. Like I have a list of you, and you're on my whiteboard, and I go through Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and I, I pray over you. And one of the things I pray is, Lord, teach them the secret of surrender. Like the more you surrender, the more the Lord rises up in you. And the more he rises up in you, the more freedom you have. And the more freedom you have, the greater life is. And the more people can see Jesus in you and the gospel is spread. And so I'm just praying over you. Lord, let them understand the secret of surrender because you are a dwelling of God. And when we worship, we are to be reminded of these things. And so when we come together and we we sing and worship, and we sing hallelujah, It's not because we like the song. It's not because the song is like, oh, that's a cool song. We ought to do it. It's because we're the church, man. We're the church. And we're to be rising up to the Lord and expressing ourselves in celebration that we used to be far from God, but now we are near to God. And we're rising up, and he lives in us. And we can't keep our mouths shut. It's like, what did Jesus say? If if they don't say something, even the rocks will cry out. Like, I don't want to be a part of a church that looks like a bunch of rocks. Like, the Lord needs rocks to cry out because we aren't. we got to learn the secret of surrender and go, man, I, I know who I am. I'm a child of the living God of the universe based upon the blood of Christ that was shed on the cross that destroyed the works of hostility towards me and put me in a position of righteousness. His righteousness is my own and I am near to God and I will rise up to Him and express myself. People will know that I'm not like everyone else. When you get around a believer who's walking in the fullness of the Spirit, they don't, like, they don't, I'm not talking about a person who acts weird and talks weird. I'm talking about a person who knows how to rise up to the Lord. And the Spirit of God has complete surrender in their lives, and, and He's moving. You just know. You like you feel comforted when you're around them. You feel joy when you're around them. You feel, you feel peace when you're around them. Why? Because they're walking in the fullness of the Spirit, and they're expressing, and the fruit of the Spirit is running over in their lives. Faith, joy, hope, love, patience, like, like all of these things are coming out of them. And what you're doing, and the reason you like being around them, is because of how near they are to Jesus. And in fact, you are walking near to Jesus because they are near to Jesus. And guess where he lives? 
in them. And so church, let's look at 2018 and say, I'm rising up to the Lord this year. Like, I don't care what else happens in my career. I don't care about what I achieve. All I'm focused on is that I'm going to rise up in the Lord and let all that other stuff take care of itself. Does that sound familiar? Seek ye first, Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven, and all these other things shall be added unto you. Rise up, church. Rise up in 2018. Rise up to the Lord. Understand that you are a dwelling of God, and he wants you to rise up and express who you are as a follower of Jesus, as a child of God that belongs to him. And so we reverse the worship today so that we could, like, just kind of rest in the Lord. One of the things that, um, that, that's so critical for you as a follower of Jesus is abide time. Like Jesus taught in John chapter 15 that apart from me, you can do nothing. It is impossible to produce fruit apart from Jesus. Well, he lives in us. And so the, the more that we learn how to surrender to he who is in us, the more fruit that is produced in our lives. And so we need, to be, we need to be good at abiding. And so today as a church, let's just abide. Like, like, let's not sing three more songs. Let's abide in the Lord today. 